Thanks to all of you who have come today. It uh, means a lot to us, and we're glad you're here. I uh, really appreciate the Williamson County Public Library providing this facility. And my special thanks go to Miss Lindsay there. She's the one that been in charge of everything and getting it set. It's an honor to be with you. Today we're going to look at Vietnam and the Vietnam experience, not just the combat side of it. In fact, we'll probably talk very little about the combat side. I salute all the veterans who may be here, active duty or veterans who've been here. I also salute those 58,267 who went to Vietnam and did not come back. There are no noble wars. There are no ob only noble warriors, not noble wars. The Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C., some of you may have been there and seen it. Next time you go to Washington, D.C., go to the Vietnam Memorial Wall, and you can see the 58,267 names that's on that wall. Over the years, I've been there a couple of times, and it's not easy. I have several friends whose name's on the wall. I'm originally from Bed Bedford County or Shelbyville. In 1958, I graduated from Central High School in Shelbyville with a fellow named Charlie Tucker. Charlie Tucker and I were classmates in high school. A couple of years later, we went to Middle Tennessee State College back then and graduated in 1962. We both were commissioned as second lieutenants and we went different ways. Charlie Tucker was born in 1938. He died in 1965. Charlie was a helicopter pilot, and he died when his chopper was shot down in Vietnam. I saw Charles Tucker the last time in 1962 when we graduated and were commissioned as lieutenants. In, in 2002, Charles' son, Christopher, left a note for his father at the wall. It said, I never knew you. I was only two years old but you're my father and I love you. Here are the facts about the Vietnam War, war and wall. There are 58,267 names on that wall. 58,267 names that are there. The largest age group killed in Vietnam, 33,103 were only 18 years old. 33,103 were 18 years old. In other words, high school seniors or college freshmen. 8,268 were 19 years old. 12 soldiers were 17 years old, killed in Vietnam. Five were 16 years old. The youngest soldier killed in Vietnam was Private First Class Dan Bullock, 15 years old. 997 soldiers were killed on their first day in Vietnam. 1,448 soldiers were killed on their last day in Vietnam. My two experiences there, I can say, as you were getting close to the end of your tour, things started to become very serious and very important. You prayed not only once a day, you prayed two or three times a day. Get me back home safely. The most death that occurred in a single day in Vietnam January 1968, 245 soldiers were killed. 31 sets of brothers are listed on the wall. Eight women names are on the wall. They were killed while nursing the wounded. Bellsville, Ohio, a town of 475 people, lost six of its sons in Vietnam. 475 population, they lost six in Vietnam. My county, Bedford County, the seat is Shelbyville, we lost 12 soldiers in the Vietnam experience. And our population was about 29,000. So really the region, the area you're in could vary quite a bit. Like Korea, there was no formal declaration of war for Vietnam. Both Korea and Vietnam were labeled as quote, conflicts. And yes, they were. North Vietnam, invaded South Vietnam. North Korea invaded South Korea. Both of these conflicts were unlike World War II. And you remember World War II, some of us were really uh, kind of small then. World War II started 
December the 7th, 1941, what happened on that day of infamy? The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. It bombed Pearl Harbor in a secret attack. Torah, 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 which is Japanese for tiger, tiger, tiger. One of the best kept secrets in history, the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. In fact, some of the Japanese admirals, when they left the Tokyo area, did not know where they were going. It was that secret. They were later told at sea, go bomb Pearl Harbor. Actually, we declared war on Japan on December the 8th, the day after Pearl Harbor. The following day, Hitler declared war on the United States. Hitler was joined with his allies, his Axis forces of Austria and Italy. A lot of people today still don't know that one, one time we were at war with Italy. Of course, now we're good friends. We are with Austria as well. Italy and Austria stayed with Hitler till the end of the war. And actually, as you probably know, the demise of Hitler in a bunker in Berlin. The Vietnam War was complex and confusing. Our military was serving with distinction and honor were fighting and dying. During that period, there was widespread demonstrations against our involvement in Vietnam. Such discontent and social disorder did not occur during Second World War or Korea, but it did in Viet during Vietnam. These events forced unnecessary hardship on our military, some of which still have hard, uh, problems with it. In some cases during the Vietnam era, our soldiers had to be cautious in wearing their uniform, especially around college campuses, because in some areas, college towns, were basically almost openly hostile toward the military. One of the worst cases was Berkeley, California, which was a hotbed of dissent against the war. Unfortunately, it, they were against the war, but they were revolting against the military was the symbol of the war. Actually, some of the dissenters did so, so, such bad things that the, the American public still holds it against us. Don't mention the name Jane Fonda around some of the veterans. During this turbulent period, some of the dissenters went too far. On the other hand, I was always proud of Tennessee. Tennessee never had a revolt, never had a dissent against our military, even during the height of the Vietnam War. Now it's especially gratifying to see how our citizens treat the military, especially those Iraq and Afghanistan visitors or veterans who come back. Today, to show respect to military is an easy way and a simple way and effective way to do that. When you see a, a military person in uniform, place your hand over your heart, extend your hand, palm up toward the soldier and say, thank you. They'll get the message. They know what it means. Also, be ready for some impromptu hugs, because you are going to get some hugs. Hugs. <clears throat> Not always could the military travel in what we call now the fatigues or battle dress uniform. We had to wear Class A's. Uh, it really came home to me in 1963 when I went to the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. to get orders to go to Special Forces in Europe. I was flying on American Airlines back from D.C., Washington, D.C., to Nashville. I was comfortably seated, seated in uh, seat 17E. And then walking down the aisle was, and at that time I was not married, I didn't even have a, a steady girlfriend, was one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. She was dressed in American Airlines stewardess uniform, as we call them. We didn't call them flight attendants back then, they were what? Stewardess, as the older folks remember that. She came directly to me and says, Lieutenant, you need to move. And I said, well, here's my ticket. I'm in 17E. She said, Lieutenant, I know <laughs> what seat you're in, uh, but you're going to move up to 2B. I thought, 2B, well, that's first class. She said, Lieutenant, just follow me. I got up and I did what she told me. I followed her and I went up to 2B, which was first class. I had just a regular seat ticket. The reason back then we traveled in, in uniforms is because we got military rates. And to get a military rate, you had to travel in the uniform. 
And when you're a lieutenant making $222 a month, getting a discounted ticket is real good. On the back of my card, there's a sticker that states simply, Vietnam, I served. Within the last couple of months, on different occasions, guys in lines behind me at gas stations came up to my car, shook my hand, and thanked me for my service. These were total strangers. I appreciated what they did. Shortly after that, when I was driving on Murray Lane, a lady, and stopped at a red light, a lady motioned for me to t roll down my window. I did, I did what I was told. She said, thank you for your service, and I regret you were not treated better when you came back from Vietnam. I said, thank you, ma'am, ma and God bless you. The generosity of strangers reminded me also of my first tour in 1966 when I was at Camp Fubai in Special Forces, we received a care package one day, which was just a cardboard box wrapped up. I opened my care package, and inside it were, of course, the fruitcake, the fudge candy, cookies, and a lot of goodies. And inside it also was a note. Thank you for your service. Ladies Club Des, Mo Ladies Club Des Moines, Iowa. I'll always remember that. And it really makes us think, back then, yes, people did care. They still care today, and they always will. People who dissent, people who cause problems, get more attention. It was an honor to serve two tours in Vietnam. The first was October 66 to 67. The second was July 71 to 72. For my first tour, my young wife and I we had flown from the 10th Special Forces Group in Bavaria, Germany, to Tennessee to spend time with my family before I went to Vietnam the first tour. We had a good visit, and after that, Frederica had always read about the beauty of America, but never saw it. She said, we're going to drive to California. I said, oh, okay. And we drove to California from Tennessee, and I'm glad we did, because folks, there's only one way to see this country. Drive it. You don't see much at 30,000 feet from an airplane if you see anything except runways. I'm glad we did. It deepened my appreciation for the beauty of this country, and it is beauty, a beautiful country. Near the end of our trip in California, my wife wanted to go to Disney World, and we did. We got there, unfortunately, on a Monday without realizing every Monday Disneyland is closed. They're doing maintenance and whatever else, giving people a break. But we got there on a Monday, Disneyland was closed, except the monorail was running, and it's a great way to see Disneyland from the air. And it's a comfortable ride, you see everything. In fact, I think it's even better than going there and walking around. But anyway, we had a good visit in the monorail, and when we got back to the station, we went and started looking for our car. I don't know if you've been to Disney World or not, but the parking lot's got about six or seven miles square. It is huge, to say the least. Anyway, luckily, there were not many other cars there, and we found our car. So we get in the car. We're driving out of the parking lot. I look in the rearview mirror. I see a police car. Then his blue lights come on. I thought, wait a minute. There are no speed signs here. There's no markings on the... There's really nothing. Anyway, I knew what those blue lights meant. And with no other cars around, I knew it was me that was getting pulled over. So I stopped, got my license ready. The officer gets out of his car with a big ticket book. <laughs> and he walks directly to my door. At that point, Frederica did, my wife did something that was brilliant. She looked at the officer and looked at me. Said, here you are, going to Vietnam, and you're getting a ticket. He said, are you going to fly from Oakland? I said, we're going to go to Oakland and fly to, out of San Francisco. He folded his ticket book and says, you're going to follow me. He pulled his car in front of my car, kept the blue light on, and said, I'm going to give you an uh, escort out to the freeway. He did. As we approached the freeway, well, there's another car pulled off to the right side. And this car had an officer standing out beside it, and he saluted us as we drove by. Very touching situation. You don't find that very often. But anyway, now, over 40 years later, I still don't know why he pulled us over. Maybe he was just bored. I don't know. But 
the point of it is it's not important why he did it. We're glad that it happened as it did. He was an honor to serve the two tours in Vietnam. The first tour, like I say, my wife and I went to California. I flew to Vietnam and she flew back to Bavaria with Muti, mother, and Opa, Papa. And she, I knew she was going to be safe because, in fact, they were like parents to me as well. I love both of them. Anyway, anyway, we had a good, uh, good visit in Tennessee. We had a good visit in California. And then after I went to Vietnam, my wife went back and stayed with her mother and father. I landed in Vietnam in 1966 when my wife was safely back in Bavaria. We had no kids and few worries. In 1966, things moved quickly. I was processing in at the headquarters of the 5th Special Forces Group where I had volunteered. I was handed a notice as I was processing in. You have been selected as a survivor assistance officer. I really didn't know what that meant, but what it meant was I was taking care of the affairs of two special forces sergeant who had been killed recently. Part of my job, in addition to inventory, their personal effects, their uniforms and things like that, was writing a letter to the next of kin, and that's not easy. Fortunately, the personnel section gave me sample letters and I was able to get something written to the families of those sergeants. A couple of days later, I was on a helicopter flying out to my camp in Phu Bai, which is south of Way, Vietnam, and the war had become a reality. It was now happening. <clears throat> Beforehand, we do not know how we're going to react in combat. Very few people know for sure. You think you might know, but you really don't know. But the one thing you learn quickly, to really appreciate the meaning of life, you must have been faced with losing it. And that's a feeling the protected shall never know. I was assigned first to the 5th Special Forces Group Airborne, volunteered to join a military assistance command studies and observations group. What the heck is that? Anyway, it turned out to be the most elite special operations group in Vietnam. It consisted only of volunteers, Navy SEALs, Air Force Air Commandos, and Special Forces Green Beret. I became a member of that organization. Our mission was kind of classified. We couldn't talk about it. We didn't talk about it. And the areas we went into were called classified areas. It worked. We had good success. One of our, one of our missions was to capture a prisoner to be taken back and be interrogated and to found out, find out more intelligence about what the North Vietnamese are doing. Anyway, we also were given the mission of bombing with bombs in the road, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, calling in airstrikes and trying to disrupt the activities of the North Vietnamese Army. Of course, they were much larger than we were. We had initially a lot of successes until the North Vietnamese put out the word, get them, get SOG, get these people who go behind our lines. We want them, we, and they started sending hunter-killer teams after us. And usually after that, when we went into these classified areas, we didn't stay very long. And sometimes we had to be extracted the same day. Our elite Teams were called spike teams, named after the U.S. state. My, my first spike team was Team Kansas. Again, they're, all of them are named after U.S. states. And the spike team would consist of two Americans, usually a master sergeant or a lieutenant like me, or it would be Vietnamese uh, warrant officers and eight or ten mountain yard or Nung tribesmen. And then our larger groups were called hatchet forces. Hatchet forces would go up to the size of about 30 troops. We could never have more than 30 troops on the ground in a classified area. Because if we did, and we got wiped out or captured, they could claim that we were expanding the war. And that was a political type thing you had to be careful about. My second tour in Vietnam, 1971 to 72, was less hectic. I was an older guy then. In fact, I was 31 years old, and by Vietnam standards, that's a pretty old guy. 
The worst thing that happened during that year, year of 1971 to 72 was the passing of my father in April 72. The Red Cross and the Army performed brilliantly. The emergency services got me back to Tennessee in time for my daddy's funeral in Shelbyville. A couple of days later, I was back in Vietnam in my regular job. Sadly to say, I would never go fishing with my, dad, my, with my daddy again. But I have to always think of the way the, the Army and the Red Cross worked together, and they did get us back any time you had a situation like that. Sadly, these things happened. The military was set up, and it did a good job with this grave registration of getting people back, both the alive and the dead. In December 1970, before kids and after my first tour in Vietnam, Frederick and I went skiing in Vail, Colorado. In fact, we had met skiing in Bavaria at night. She was a great skier. We used to go on ski trips together, but we didn't ski together. She's an expert skier, goes down the slopes like this, the black diamonds and all that. I'm a guy that usually don't look very good the way I'm skiing. She, she said, you don't look like a skier. I said, oh, okay. Anyway, if your wife criticizes you, you know, get used to it. I am 54 years. But anyway, we were skiing in Vail, Colorado, and I get on this chairlift. Actually, it's, a, it's like a bench going up the mountain. And I'm there by myself, and all of a sudden, two guys ski on, get on the lift beside me. Long hair, straggly, and everything else, and I could tell these are flower children. <clears throat> they looked at me and saw my Army flight, flight jacket and said, are you in the Army? I said, well, kind of. And they said, what do you mean kind of? I said, uh, Coast Guard. <laughs> they said, uh, dude, you don't look like Coast Guard. I had this coarse short hair back then and all that. Anyway, uh, they said, where are you in the Coast Guard? I said, the Polish Coast Guard. And they said, look, Poland doesn't have a coast. It has no Coast Guard. And it went downhill from there. <laughs> then they started picking on me and said, you were in Vietnam? I said, yes. Then you're a baby killer. I said, I hope not. You know, and uh, it got kind of interesting by the time we got to the top of the mountain. Anyway, I was being nice to them because here, those guys were bigger than me, and there's two of them, and those chairlifts go up sometimes 40 or 50 feet high, so I didn't want to make any enemies. Uh, anyway, days after that, they would hook up with me skiing. The last day we were there was especially special. Frederick had already gone down. I'm skiing down later. And I look at the guys at the bottom at the slope there, and they're there in an old VW van from California with psychedelic letters and flowers all over it. And they open the door and the smoke comes boiling out. Of course, they're enjoying their weed or marijuana. And they say, hey, Herman, come on. I say, hey, sorry, guys, I'm late already. And then two of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen in my life come walking out of the trailer. And I thought, man, how can this be? Anyway, about 10 years later, after the, my second tour in Nam, we came back again. Frederick and I went skiing again to Vail, Colorado. At that time, then, we had a couple of little ones with us who became good skiers like their mother. And that was, experience was very different than my first experience in 1971. Very different. And after a couple of days, Frederick said to me, he says, it's not the same, is it? I said, no. Nope. She said, you miss them, don't you? I said, yep. Talking about the hippies, flower children. <laughs> How could somebody that's so straight-laced, militarish, uh, become attached to hippies and yippies? After, hostil after hostilities ended in Vietnam in 1975, the North Vietnamese Supreme Military Commander, General Vo Giap, surprised many by letting it be known that had the bombing of North Vietnam, North Vietnam continued, he had planned to surrender all North Vietnam forces. And he could have done it. He was a supreme commander of all North Vietnamese forces. This plan was not known by the United States. Of course, we would have got bombing. Today, Vietnam, like Germany, is a unified country with no North or South. And like Korea, no, Korea, though, still is a North Korea and a South Korea, but Vietnam is all one country. In fact, 
The beautiful city of Saigon is no longer Saigon. It's Ho Chi Minh City. There are three cities of the world that were named the Paris. Paris, France, of course, is the real Paris. The Paris of the Orient was Saigon. And the Paris of North America, and I hope you go there someday, is Montreal. Three beautiful cities. But of course, there's no more Saigon. It's now called Ho Chi Minh City. General Giap was a brilliant, highly respected leader. He was the leader of all North Vietnam forces. And the following is a quote from his memoirs, which are found now in the War Memorial in Hanoi. What we still, quoting General Giap, what we still don't understand is why you Americans stopped bombing Hanoi. You had us on the ropes. We were ready to surrender in another day or two. And he said, but we were elated to notice your media and the dissensions in America. They were doing more to damage America than we were doing on the battlefield. We were ready to surrender. And he published his memoirs and confirmed what most Americans knew. Vietnam War was not lost in Vietnam. It was lost in America. We still see some of the carryover from that if we are attuned to what's going on in the media. And as General Giap also said, do not fear the enemy, for he can take only your life. Fear the media. They will try to destroy your honor. Vietnam was a special situation. And there were some things about Vietnam that a lot of people still don't know. In Vietnam, we had two military forces with us, friendly military. First was South Korea. And I have to say, having seen the South Koreans on the battlefield, they are awesome soldiers. They are true warriors. Uh, in fact, in some areas, they were not as many of them as they were with us. They did, had smaller operations, basically pacification programs, in dealing with the local civilians. But they were awesome soldiers. In fact, uh, sometimes the South Koreans had a hard time finding the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong really never had a hard time finding us. But the Viet Cong avoided the South Koreans because the South Koreans did certain things that we don't do in our country. Next force, similar to South Korea, was Australia. Australia has also has some out outstanding warriors and soldiers. And they were a big comfort to us. Uh, and both these countries basically stayed in the, in the area with us till about 1975 when the Paris Peace Accords were signed and both of them left more or less when we did. Another f thing about Vietnam, very special. In fact, I plan to be contacting probably CBS News and one of the others. I want to see a, a program on the Helgoland. The Helgoland was a large cruise ship, ocean-going cruise ship owned by Germany. The German Red Cross purchased that ship and turned it into a hospital ship. It had operating rooms. It had 150 beds. It had 38 doctors and nurses, and of course, maintenance people and food service people and people like that. But the Helgoland's mission was totally civilian. They never, they never cared for wounded military on either side. They were neutral, and they were there to help the civilians. And they actually saved thousands of lives, because again, you're talking about real good doctors and nurses. Um, that name means a lot in Germany today, when you say Helgoland, those who, oh, the older crowd or the seniors like us, they know what this was. And it deserves a special place in history. Vietnam, very talented people. This thing you see here is an elephant, it's ceramic. ceramic. This I purchased in Vietnam. In fact, it's got a little logo on the side here of Vietnam. I think I paid $15 for this. It's been appraised at over $500 back in the States. Of course, we're not going to sell it. But as I was telling the lady before, right before our presentation, I was at the post office one day in Saigon, and I was going to mail a package back to my wife in Germany. And a guy came walking up with five of these. He set them on the counter, 
and he just had a little tag tied around the, the, the spout here, or the trunk. I said, sir, aren't you going to put those in a box? He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, I have sent over 100 back to Nevada, and all I do is put a tag on them. He said, guess what? If you put this in a box, guess how it's going to be handled by the postal people or by the shipping people? What do people do with boxes? They throw them. What do they do with these? They're cautious with them. Another thing that the Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese were good at was doing all sort of brass work. This is an artillery shell, 105 howitzer that was shot or fired in Vietnam at one of our base camps. The Vietnamese really would, as soon as the firing stops or the artillery stops, the Vietnamese would come in and start grabbing these things. Why? Because it's solid brass. And they can make beautiful things out of it like this. And I think this cost me $10. You know, live and learn. I wish I had bought 100 of them, but you know, that's the way it goes. We've got two at home. My wife treasures both of them, and she's uh, happy with them. Finally, let me mention to you, as I said before, I have a lot of friends whose names on the Vietnam Wall. This is Leon G. Holton. He was born in May 1938. He died in October 65. Leon was 27 years old. One of the finest officers I've ever known. This is actually his picture. And you can get this by going to this website. Anybody can do this 24-7 www.virtualwall.org and you can look up people who were killed in Vietnam either by their last name or by their state. I mentioned before Bellsville, Ohio that lost a town of 475 people that lost six soldiers. You can go to Bellsville, Ohio on this website and you can see the names of those soldiers. You can also see pictures of them and on the back is the casualty data. I would encourage you to, if you know someone who served in Vietnam or you didn't know what happened to them, you may want to go on the virtual wall to this wall website. It's all free, of course, and look them up. This concludes our presentation. Let me ask, does anyone have a question? We'll be glad to answer if we can. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Were there actually Russians helping the North Vietnamese? Possibly, but they were only in an advisory role. They had no ground troops. Russia had no ground troops in Vietnam as far as we know. And I, that's really not the reason we pulled out. We pulled out basically because of the political pressure against our government and something that the government wanted to do anyway. But again, had we waited just a little longer the North Vietnamese were going to surrender. We didn't know that. But Russian involvement, no. Yes, sir. Uh, how come the, the rumors, I don't know if there's any validity to it, that uh, a lot of the POWs were shipped to Russia from Vietnam and held, held in Siberia or someplace in Russia? Is there any validity to that? I've never heard of it, sir. I, I doubt it. I don't think it's true. No, sir. The North Vietnamese, uh, I won't say they were good captors. They did use some torture. But as far as moving our prisoners or POWs to other areas, no, I don't think so. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Okay. I was in the service, uh, graduated from Middle Tennessee State College in 1962, was commissioned as a second lieutenant, and I stayed then 20 years to 82. I would have to say that's the best thing I ever did in my life. I, uh, I met my wife while I was in, in the military in Bavaria, skiing at night. We're still together after 54 years. Uh, I've had a lot of, I've traveled to 24 different countries. I've served 11 years overseas. I was six years in Germany, 
three years in Belgium and two years in Vietnam. And I wouldn't want to swap with anybody for anything. In the States, my first service was in Fort Benning, Georgia, where I went to Infantry, Airborne, and Ranger School. And then I went to Special Forces School in North Carolina. Then we, we lived in Augusta, Georgia for a couple of years. We've also lived in Kansas, where I was in Command and Staff College. And we lived in Jersey. Uh, I didn't pick up much of a Jersey accent, but I am partial toward New Jersey. I think they get a bad rap sometimes, but anyway. They do make fun of your accent, so if you go to Jersey, be a little careful, you know. Uh, and it's not vicious, that's just the way things are. But then I retired in 1982, which was not easy. At the time I was in the Pentagon, then I went to Walt Reed Medical Center as the police chief, and I retired from there. I would have stayed longer, but actually my insurance man came by one night and said, Herman, what are you going to do after the Army? I said, George, I have no idea. He said, you better think about it. You've got 18 years in now. You can retire at 20, and you want to start looking for a job when you're 42, not 52. I said, okay. So I, I retired. I listened to my counselor. <clears throat> but I have to say, like for young people today, there's no better career. I, I can't think of anything better. As I told uh, the guys before the meeting today, my wife has a friend who has a daughter. They both grew up in B Bavaria. And my friend's daughter, or my wife's friend's daughter, just turned 38 years old. She retired last month, 20 year service. She went in at 18, retired at 38 as a Master Sergeant E8. She's not rich, but she's never going to be poor either. She's never going to go hungry. And she's got VA compensation for life, and she's got uh, TRICARE for life health care. And now she writes her own ticket. In fact, a lot of companies find her to be exceptionally talented, more than having a lot of education. This girl has life experience. She rose up the ranks real quickly, could have even gone higher, but she was smart enough to know hey, I can enjoy life now at 38. Those of us twice that age uh, say, yep, I think she did the right thing. But I, yes, sir. First of all, let me just say thank you for your service. Uh, I think it's really important that people hear the, the memories and the stories of veterans, and especially Vietnam veterans. And I just wanted to mention one thing. I'm a history professor at Lipscomb military historian. About a year ago, I heard that uh, there are about 18,000 Vietnam veterans who live in Davidson County. I, I was floored. Uh, and so we decided that it would be important to preserve those memories uh, of the war. So we started an oral history project. We're interviewing Vietnam veterans who are willing to be videotaped talking about their memories, and so, and I like to come to events like this because I like to hear these stories, but also like the possibility of running into veterans who, who, who are willing to do a, do a taped interview, and, and we're also, by the way, planning uh, a special event, free event to commemorate veterans uh, on November the 7th, and I'm Great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Did you ever come into contact with the mountain yards on the ball? Yes, ma'am. The mountain yards were special. They, they basically were tribesmen, and they lived in the jungle. And they really became part of the jungle. In fact, it was something when I went down to the Saigon area between missions and things like that, and you would see these villagers, these mountain yards, sitting on the side of the road just watching. See, they had no cars. They had no airplanes. The only airplanes they saw was basically the helicopters that we were flying in or, uh, or the uh, bombing by our, our Air Force. These people were basically tribesmen, and they lived out in the jungle. And sometimes when you went on operations with them, you had to be a little careful because you'd be walking along a trail or something, and all of a sudden look around and say, where are they? They blended in. They were magnificent fighters, zero fear, very courageous, 
and they turned out to be some of the best soldiers we've ever had as mercenaries. They were not members of the South Vietnamese Army or the American Army. They were mercenaries. In fact, a lot of my soldiers in my first tour in Fubai were Nung mercenaries. They were civilians. By joining us, the 5th Special Forces Group, by joining us, they didn't have to go to the South Vietnamese Army. One reason they wanted to go with us, they got fed more and they got paid more. And for soldiers, that's real important. But I have to say, you get really attached to these people. Uh, they almost become like your, your children. Uh, and, and they do. They become good soldiers. And they do follow you. And never one time did I see one re refuse to do something or protest about anything. They didn't know how to complain. Some people say that's a learned skill. I don't know. But some people have no trouble complaining. They became that because there was no work in Nepal. And so this is a way that they got out of there. And once they do, their knife, they had to draw blood. Right. Right. And that was, you don't draw your knife unless you draw blood. They were very talented. You didn't want to fight. You didn't want to fight them as an adversary. You wanted them as an ally, just like the South Koreans. I have to say that's probably the finest soldiers I've ever been with. The South Koreans. We didn't have joint operations, but I knew what they were doing, and I saw the results of some of it, and it's magnificent. One final thing I'd mention to you is, right before my first tour in Vietnam, my father knew the kind of what I was getting involved in, and. Uh, he started to worry about me. My mother worried a little about me too, actually more. And one night I remember sitting late at night with my mother and father, and I said to both of them, I said, you guys can really be proud. You got four sons who all graduated from the same college. Mother started to cry. She said, Herman, there were five of you. The one before you didn't make it. I never knew I had a brother that didn't make it. But how hard is that as a parent to lose a child? This one was lost at birth, and I've always now considered he's my guardian angel, and I really think he is. I've become more and more religious over the years. Now I say thank you every night when I go to bed, and I say thank you to him every morning when I get up. Because if you get up above ground, that's an achievement day started good. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate all of you coming. Any, but any other questions or comments that you may have? Did you notice that when you went into Saigon that the uh, Vietnamese, the officers were in the restaurants and in the places while our boys were out fighting? Well, yes and no. Yeah. I'd have to say the South Vietnamese stayed pretty well. And you have to understand too, who were the South Vietnamese fighting? Other Vietnamese, other people. Other people. You know, we had an experience like that in 1861 to 1865 called the Civil War. And in Vietnam, it was a civil war in essence. And the, Viet, the uh, South Vietnamese were not only fighting the North Vietnamese, they were fighting the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong were civilians, but they were communist civilians. Farmers by day, terrorists, and bombers at night. The Viet Cong, where I, oper I operated up in the northern area around Khe Sanh, we had no Vietnam, a Viet Cong. They were all North Vietnamese. And I have to say, too, the North Vietnamese were extremely good soldiers. They were disciplined, they were loyal, uh, and they did a good job, unfortunately f for us in some occasions. But as General Jap said, it, during the Tet Offensive, Tet is basically the Buddhist New Year, during the Tet Offensive in, in 1968, we lost several people, several of our soldiers. More devastated was the North Vietnamese Army. It basically had its back broken during the Tet Offensive. North Vietnamese knew that and admitted it, but we didn't know it and we didn't admit it. We, meaning the politicians and the press. But the soldiers on the ground knew it. We had beaten North Vietnam's best. but. Unfortunately, the credit went the other way. 
our focus, the focus of the American media, was on the number of people that we had killed. And that's important to have. But basically, give credit where credit is due. We beat the North, Vietnam, North Vietnamese and, and the Viet Cong. They knew it. But we didn't acknowledge it, or our government didn't acknowledge it. So I don't like to get off in the weeds on politics. I don't understand it that well. But uh, war is based on politics, or there's a lot of it. And we see that going on right now. Will it change? Who knows? Any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, ma'am. Is he still in service now? Oh. Right. No, ma'am, I didn't meet him. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. 62 was the good year <laughs> to graduate from college. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. There's no mystery there, I don't think. <laughs> it's, it's really a sad situation. But as General Giap acknowledged that he was once asked, how much harm did Jane Fonda do to America and to our soldiers? He said, she gave me an extra three divisions of soldiers. That's how effective she was. The tragedy of it is, did she even realize what she was doing? I don't know. Of course, we all know it was wrong. And those are sorts of things that are not forgiven. Here or up there. You've been a great group. I've really enjoyed being with you. You remind me of the last group I talked to, the Daughters of the American Revolution. As I mentioned to some of the other people before, that's the most patriotic and red-blooded group of ladies I have ever seen. You talk about patriotic. They are very patriotic. And you better watch your P's and Q's when you're around them because they will correct you real fast. And I guess I was having a great discussion with them and I got to one point about the names on the Vietnam Wall. And I said, the largest age group killed, 31,103, were 18 years old. They got out to napkins. That's too young too young to die. These, those guys died in combat for us. And that's really affected me emotionally, that people this, this far out still remember that, and they react to it. So again, let me encourage you, when you get a chance, go to the www.virtualwall.org, all lowercase, and you can find anybody who's been a casualty or who was killed in Vietnam, to include our eight women nurses. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Did you talk about your resources and there's hundreds of books out there on Vietnam and is there anything that really, you know, people can have confidence that this is, you know, a, a real good story? These, the, all three of these are good references. In fact, I didn't get these. My wife got them for me. So... Usually I have to say anything she does is good, but uh, they are all very good. There's a lot of pictorial history there, and you'll see get, even going back to the early days of the Viet Minh and Dien Bien Phu when the French were in Vietnam. In fact, the influence of the French in Vietnam was still very, when I was there, was very strong. Uh, and I'm one that uh, really likes these pictorial history because the, this is very accurate. There's no politics in that. That's all very accurate stuff. So I'm not an expert on it. All I can say is I was honored to be there twice. 
And I thank him for bringing me back. Any other comments? Questions? My brother-in-law that I told you was in Vietnam for tours. His wife-to-be later was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And she ended up in Da Nang when he was brought in the last time and was shot. But then she would have been the first woman admiral, but she was married to him and then she retired as captain. So they served well. Good. Yes, ma'am. It was really, the, I would have to say that the medical operations in Vietnam was number one. First class, A plus all the way. We had soldiers being shot on the battlefield. Within a matter of minutes, sometimes, they were back at a hospital, thanks to the helicopters and the pilots, and being treated some of the best treatment possible. And that's the reason today you see so many amputees and severely wounded people I do a lot of work with the Joshua Chamberlain Society, which basically is a charity for the fallen and the critically wounded. And uh, all of them thank the medical services. In fact, when you see these kids walking around with no legs or one or two legs, uh, say thank you. And they basically, everyone will praise the medical operation of the United States. And I hope it always stays that way, you know. It was comforting to know that if you were wounded on the battlefield, somebody would take care of you. That's a lot of comfort. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. You've been a great group. I've enjoyed chatting with you. And uh, wish you a good day and all that. And thanks again to our friend Lindsay there. She's a, she's a real champion. I would say she's a real warrior, but I don't know that she, she would want that. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.